I'm going to introduce. You could stand here for a long, long time. I've been fortunate in knowing Abby for 17 years. That's the length of time I know Bill, too. I met Abby 17 years ago. Bill met him almost 24 years ago. Fate, call it what you will, grace of God. But if it were not for the man that you're about to hear, you wouldn't be having this meeting tonight. Because he's the first guy that brought the message to our boy Bill. If you've read the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know that most of you have, in there you'll hear in Bill's story always we referring to my friend. And then in the later book, describing Alcoholics Anonymous and other stories that just came out some short time ago, the name Ebby comes out. But always in the first book you'll hear him referred to as my friend. Should you hear a lot of us at different times and in different parts of the country quoting us how Bill came in, how the organization or the fellowship started, there's only one man in the world tonight who knows exactly how it started, because he was sober and Bill was drunk. So, I give you my friend and your friend, our founder, Abby. Thank you, Dick. I was Dick Soldier. My name is Abby, and I'm an alcoholic. I don't know just how to start this off. The dick asked me over here. I was very glad to come if I wanted to meet some of you Memphis people. But I had an idea. I was one of two or three speakers, and I didn't know I was going to hold this thing down for 40 or 45 minutes. And back home in Dallas, I'm known as the world's shortest speaker. They used me back there on the different clothes for the 10 minute and 15 minute spot. So I don't know how I'm going to go about holding down for 45 minutes, but I do the best I can. As I say, I've been living in Texas for five years now. Maybe I've gotten enough of that Texas braggadocio somewhere in my system. Maybe I will serve so much so I can pull some of that out of the hack. There's a story I heard a year or two after I got in Dallas that all oh, the a while fancy. I hope you'll indulge me and let me tell it. As a Texas rancher drove over to his nearest neighbor, it was about 15 miles, and said, What do you say we go to town and make a day of it? Yeah, I said, All right. Got his hat, and they got in the car, and they started out. As soon as they got out of sight of the ranch house, they opened up the fifth of bourbon, had a good long pull on the bottle, and the first guy said, You know, so they shipped 2,000 bulls from. Fort Worth the day before yesterday. Nothing was said. They drove on a while and came to a gate and they had to open that. They had another pull at the bottle and the second guy said, well, you know, I shipped 2,500 bulls from my siding four or five days ago. So they drove along and just before they got to the main state highway, they stopped for a third good hooker. And the, the first rancher said again, you know, I think we're the two biggest bull shippers in Texas. And I hope I've acquired a little of that so I can get it out tonight. I know that Dick and Jim Drake and some of the other boys wanted me to tell you some of the beginnings of AA as I experienced them. And you know, I think that I appreciate the things that Dick has said and other people have said about me. But I sometimes think of my chief claim to fame is that I'm Exhibit A in the antique division of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's about it. Well, I got to go back to some of my beginnings. I started drinking when I was in school. I come from Auburn in New York as my native 
town. Went to a private school there. And I started drinking them last year. I seem to hold it under control pretty well. But I did get off on a wild party one night. It was a military school, and we had a, a competitive drill. And after the drill, we all went out, and then his son went out and got drunk. And we got in a mess, and the principal of the school heard about it. But nothing was said. But I, uh, yeah, I wasn't very well that spring, and they took me out of school before... School was over, and that time the principal wrote to my father, and he always called me Ed. He didn't call me Ebby or Ed. He said, I don't think we can do anything more for Ed. Which meant that he was just uh, telling me from school. So that fall, my father said, you're going to work in the foundry. My father happened to be in the iron foundry business. So I went to work that fall. And, uh... I confined my drinking to Saturday nights. Naturally, I had to get up at 6 o'clock and go down. I worked in the, as a molder's helper, which is fairly rugged work, as you may know. And I did that for a year, and I confined most of my drinking to Saturday nights, except around Christmas time when all the dances were going on. And then I really stepped out. I remember I tried to go to work with the drinking and the dancing and getting down to work at 7 o'clock in the morning, but I was young, and you shake it off and work it off by night. And I managed to get away with it for a while. But as I look back and remember those times, I wasn't a very successful drinker from the start. There were times, too, when I'd take some of the older guys around all me home. And other times, I'd be climbing a chandelier after three or four drinks. I never knew what was going to happen. The fact of the matter is, when I was about 15 years old, I remember putting a lot of thought into this business of drinking because it was in my family. My brothers drank pretty heavily. My father did. And uh, I kind of figured that if they drank that way and it wasn't any good for them and it was no good for me either because I was just about the same temperament as they were. But it was that first drink that I ever took on my own, when I walked into the bar of the hotel tonight, and called me and ordered a glass of beer all by myself, and I was a big shot. And I still say that was the damn best glass of beer I ever tasted. Sometimes I can almost taste it again. And somehow that that just gave me just the same glow, and uh, that beer was a lot stronger in those days, and it was real beer. That was about 1914, I think. 19, yes, it was 1914. And I know that I said to myself, this is for me. And soon after that, when I started drinking, I kept it down pretty well, like two or three drinks. I used to go out of uh, an evening that spring. Uh, and this friend of mine I went to school with, he called me up and asked me if I had my lessons done. I said, sure, I guess it's just a stall because the family was sitting in the room. And I said, sure, Andy, I'll go out and have a chocolate milk with you. I got time. And we were far from chocolate milk. But I managed to get home by 11 o'clock, so there was nobody knowing about it. But I know that the effect and the taste of alcohol is a, it was fascinating to me from the beginning. And later on, I read a book called The Common Sense of Drinking, from which a lot of AA was taken by Dick Peabody. He's not dead, but he was one of the first of the lay therapists that had a tremendous following of alcoholics. A lot of other books have been written by a lot of his pupils. Glass Crutch is one of them by Dutch Chambers, and I can name a half a dozen. I can't think of them right now. But he said in that book that the difference between an alcoholic and a heavy drinker was that the heavy drinker might drink just as much on a given night as the alcoholic, but the next day was another day to him, and he went to work, and his first thing in the awakening in the morning was the office. Well, the first step that the alcoholic had was on the night before, and where could he get the next drink to get bring that party back again? And that always appealed to me because that's the way I was. I'd forget business and want to get somewhere where I could get with the gang again. And he said the effect of alcohol on people of your type 
It's too fascinating. You can't handle it. But I knew that. But I knew then that a um, couple of the drinking in my family, I figured out. And I better lay. Should stay away from it, but I never did once I had that drink. But as time went on, I, of course, got into a lot of more trouble. And uh, the family business broke up as one of those things do. It's been running since 1852, and it broke up in 1922. And I was more or less on the loose and going from one job to another. And getting in more trouble all the time. Our drinkingness was increasing. I didn't get overseas in World War One, but I was in the outfit that was stationed around right in my hometown of Albany. And in the state armory there, I I got to be a second lieutenant in this outfit, and we always had a jug in the officers' quarters because it was a druggist in one of the corners right near the armory. And I always somehow managed to get a barrel of whiskey, and we could get it because those were the days of prescription. The doctor would issue you a prescription during prohibition, and you'd go in and get this pint of whiskey, but we got it all we wanted. We got that gallon, gallon jug filled repeatedly. And there was a pretty two-fisted drinking crowd, and they were all older than I was. And finally, uh, we got into a jam one night. We got in a taxi wreck. And I all just got superficial cuts from my both wrists and face. But I was kind of a bloody mess. It was just bleeding a lot. My father came in. I was sitting on the bed. And he says, you get out of that national guard tomorrow morning. He says, you leave my house. Well, I didn't feel like leaving this house right then. So late that afternoon, I walked up and told the captain I was going to resign. Request to be put on the reserve. So that ended my... National Guard career, and that phase of the drinking. But things got worse, and my father and mother died in 27, my father in 29. And uh, I was sticking around then pretty bad. I inherited some money from my father. I should have had sense enough to take care of it. But I didn't. I lost half of it overnight in the stock market crash, and the rest I just went down the drain over a period of a year, a year and a half. And then we used to summer in Vermont, and it was there that I met Bill Wilson, but it was longer ago than 24 years ago. I first knew Bill about 1910, I went to school with him in 1912, which has taken us back quite a few years. And uh, as I, to get back, I, we went to summers in the Manchester, Vermont. Well, after my father died, the house was vacant up there. We bought a house after all the years that father had spent money at the hotel for all of us. He bought a house in 1923, and in 1929 he died, and the house was empty. All my other brothers were married. Father died without a will, so they just divided up the furniture and left some for me. And I had one room furnished in that house, and the rest was bare. And I was living there all alone. Drinking heavily all the time. Got a resident and we jump now. We're going to get up to the summer of 1934, which is 24 years ago. And I'd been in the toils of the law twice that summer. I'd gotten drunk, for, gotten arrested for being drunk and disorderly. Fined five dollars or something like that. And it seems that in Vermont at that time, I don't know whether the law is still on the statute books or not, but if you got arrested three times, any one given year for drunkenness, it meant six months in Windsor State Prison. Well, I was getting drunk right along. One time I got drunk. And I still don't know exactly how it happened, but I was in my own house, and finally somebody got out a wire for me. I don't have to see yet what I was doing it. I was on my own property. But uh, one of the boys, the boy that was constable at the time, was a guy that I'd gone to school with in 1912, the same year that I went to school with Bill Wilson. I forgot to say that I went to a private school in Albany, 
But this one year, I went up there in Vermont in 1912, in the fall of 1912, to go to that school for one year and then back to my other. And this other boy is John Jackson. He was constable. And I walked uptown the next day. Well, I went up and sat on the store, the, the steps of the hardware store to talk to the owner of it. Just then John drove up and said, sorry, he says, everybody got a warrant for you. Got to take you down to Bennington, which is the county seat. He took me down and saw the judge. And the uh, judge says, be back Monday. He says, we'll see what we can do about you. Well, I've gotten ahead of my story because before that, I'd say late in July or the first part of August, two men came to see me, two fellows that I had drunk with often. And one of them happened to be the son of this judge. His name is Seaver Graves, and he's now living in Paris, France. And the other one was Chet Cornell, and I don't know just where he is. I think he's somewhere in Ohio. And, uh... I had a hangover, of course, and these two guys wandered around. I was out in the back somewhere, in the kitchen, I guess. But I remember they came up the back steps. And they uh, started, they, they didn't know exactly how to begin on me, because they remembered me, and I had a lot of fun with me drinking. And I saw they had something on their mind, so I said, well, what, what do you got in your mind? What's, what's cooking? And they said, well, we kind of come and see you, and so we couldn't... Get some idea in your head about something. I said, you mean about my drinking? And he said, yeah, you're not getting anywhere. You're, I understand you're in wrong all over town. And we just sort of... Well, we just sort of... We got mixed up with a group called the Oxford Group. And we think that you could get help if you join up with it. And they said, uh, you ever think of letting God run your life instead of every Thatcher trying to run it all the time? And they really talked sense the way I figured it, and it seemed to me that they were just telling me things that I had been taught in my childhood about the right way of living. And I said, well, gee, if these two guys have got something out of this, Maybe there's hope for me because I'd just about given up hope. And I tell you, I was willing to quit drinking, but I didn't know how. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I didn't know how to do it. So I listened to them, and they left me a book by one of these men in the Oxford group. I don't recall the name of that book now. But in it, I could see myself staring out of those pages. Now, the Oxford group, let me explain, was not concentrated on alcohol, alcoholism. It was a spiritual group that was founded by a minister from Pennsylvania named Frank Bookman, B-U-C-H-M-A-N. It got its name Oxford Group because Bookman got a lot of people interested and they in turn went abroad and they went to England and Oxford University and they got a lot of people interested over there. And from there, they went to South Africa. And they got up quite a big meeting down there. I don't know if it was Cape Town or one of those cities. And the reporters referred to them as the group from Oxford, and then damn name stuck, and it had no more to do with the, with the group or its findings than anything in the world. But just like those things happen, that's the name that stuck with it. And it was called the Oxford Group. And they they were really trying to find something. It was that time in 1929 when the crash had come in Wall Street and the, the nation was kind of a low point economically. A lot of people were hopping out of windows in New York, and that's no joke because they were. A lot of them hit those manholes head on from the 30th floor. And a lot of people were drinking terribly, and they wanted to find something in this Oxford group. A lot of people came around to it, and of course a good many of them happened to be alcoholics. And don't ever let yourself think that nobody but an alcoholic can help an alcoholic because there were a lot of men in this group group that were very understanding and had a damn good knowledge of the thinking of an alcoholic's mind. And I sometimes think that I, I mind are no different than anybody else in this world. We just give in to things that other people do not. Well, anyway, that idea appealed to me. I read the book. 
And I sobered up for a few days, and I started to paint the house. But I had a ladder that was too short, and I couldn't get up to all these places. And I made a deal with a boss painter, and he sent around one of his men with some equipment, and the two of us finished the house. I didn't touch a drop all that time. But the minute that job was over, sure, I went right back to the bottle because I had nothing more to interest me. It was a letdown. And it was then, on that means after the painting of the house that I was picked up and taken to this county judge. There's one thing that sticks in my mind, and it always will. And I knew it was at that time. It may not mean nothing to you, it may not get what I mean by it, but... As we drove home that afternoon, this uh, constable, John Jackson, left me off at the house that I was living in. And he said, well, I'll be around to get you Monday. This was Friday. And he said, uh, you remember the judge says, be sober? I said, yep, I'll be sober. So I went in the house, and I remembered that down cellar I had about a half a dozen bottles of ale, and I know that they're going to be nice and cool. And there's one thing I like in this world, it's Valentine's Ale, and that was it. So I w went down cellar, and I said to myself, I can't possibly get drunk between now and Monday on six bottles of ale, and I know that nobody in town is going to sell me anymore after they've heard that I, you know what a small Vermont community is, everybody from ten miles up and down the valley knows all about anything like that. And I knew that none of, I mean, the bootleggers wouldn't sell me anything. And I got down and I reached one of those bottles and, uh-uh, that ain't cricket. So, all right, the judge said, you, you get there sober, will you? You'll be there sober. No, that, that isn't, that's cheating or somehow. And I walked back upstairs and that damn devil got on my shoulder. Get off, go on down there and take it. I couldn't take that damn ale. That's just, no, that's not, the, that's not the spirit of the thing. It might be. Technically, I might be all right. I'd get there sober, I second it. Well, that's not that's exactly what he meant. He didn't say don't take a drink, but that's exactly what he meant. So I took them and put them in a basket and carried them over to the, my next-door neighbor, and I said, here, they're yours. And that minute, I had a victory. I know that. I had something that was just like a weight being lifted from my shoulders. And I've often thought about it. In later years, when I started drinking again, why I couldn't recapture that feeling that I had then. But perhaps that service, the pink cloud, and later on you, you get a more mature, if I may use the word, outlook. But I don't think you, if you have a slip, you can ever go back again. Well, as it turned out, I went down there Monday, and there had been a third man come to see me, too. His name was Roland Hazard. And he was a pretty swell gent, too. I never knew him. I never met him before. These other two guys I had. And he was there Monday when I was brought for the judge. The judge started to give me a little lecture, and he says, Hazard, will you... Uh, Take this man and release the sure. So I was released from my own recognizance and the charges were dropped. And this guy took me and he took me back home and left me there. And a few days later, I closed the house up, went down and stayed with him. He lived about 15 miles below, south of the town. And then we went on down to New York. And I stayed with Chuck Cornell, one of these other chaps that had come to see me. I stayed there about a month, I guess. And uh, during that time, we made trips back to Vermont, Hazard and I, and two weeks after I was connected with this Oxford group, my which is a much looser membership than Alcoholics Anonymous, I really think, I went, they got me out speaking. The first weekend that I went out speaking, we went up through Vermont, I spoke in a junior college, Two churches, town meeting hall, and someplace else, all in two nights. Two afternoons and two nights. And I still don't know what I talked about. But I just felt good about the whole thing and uh, really figured that these guys must have something 
But there must be a higher power because they were the ones that originated the, the phrase, uh, believe in a higher God or a higher power as you understand him. And it was while I was doing this and, and uh, going back to New York and I heard about Bill. I hadn't seen Bill, I don't believe, for over a year, although Bill, you see, was born and raised in a town six miles north of this town of Manchester, Vermont, where I used to summer. Also spent quite a few winters there. Uh, and I heard that Bill was in pretty tough shape, drinking bad, and I had been downtown in, the, in Wall Street and seen some of my old friends, one of whom I had Bill's sister-in-law, and he said he was in tough shape, and he said, why don't you give him a ring of telephone? And I said, well, I will, but I want to think this thing out a little and get myself a pretty good story, a pretty good take to give to him. And I can truthfully say now that I believe that if I, that I went over there, that Bill would either go for it, lock, stock, and barrel, or he would have none of it. He wouldn't just play around with it for a little while. I thought that if he put his teeth into it once, he'd stick to it. Because I thought I knew him pretty well. I've been going to school with him and seen him over the years. So I called him up one night. And I didn't get Bill, but I got lost. His wife, and... Told her what had happened to me, that this must have kind of shown me something. Well, I don't even sober myself then about possibly six or seven weeks. But I think sometimes the initial effect that we get from a thing is we're more powerful then than we are later on. We get stale. Well, anyway, Lois said, watch from over to dinner some night. And uh, then she mentioned the date. I said, fine. So that night, I went over about half past five, I guess, in the evening. <laughs> and, uh, and I r rang the bell at 182 Clinton Street. The only person home was an old colored man named Green, who I've known for years. He'd been with the family. And Lois' family, that is. And he said, they're both out. Both Mrs. Wilson and Mr. Wilson and I would come on in. So pretty soon Bill appeared, and uh, he'd been drinking, but he wasn't too bad. And he said hello, and this, that, and the other thing, and he's kind of aging around. Then he made an excuse. He had to go out and get some ice cream, something else for supper, and of course, I know what he's going after. I understand. I've done it so many times myself. So, and Lois came in. And there was another girl invited. There was a girl invited because uh, she lived upstairs and had made the place uh, in some apartment. So we all sat down to dinner. And Bill's got a little garbled in the book about the gin across the kitchen table, but it don't make any difference. The idea is there. So we had dinner, and then we all moved upstairs in those houses, and we were back there in the east, most of the living rooms on the second floor. So we moved up on the second floor, and after a little hammering and hawing, Lord said, well, let's hear about yourself. So I started in. I guess they got me wound up, and I guess I talked to put in at 1 o'clock in the morning. And I remember Bill said I walked the subway with her, and I knew that he wasn't going to go for a drink, or if he had a bottle in the house anyway. And on the way over, he put his arms around my shoulder just before I went in the subway. He said, I don't know what you got, kid, but you got something, and I want to get it. Well, he didn't stop drinking right away any more than I had stopped drinking. Back there that summer when my extra group boys came to see me, but the idea was in there, and the idea happened to get in Bill's head. And at that time, I had moved to a mission on 1st Avenue and 23rd Street in New York. That he was run by Calvary Episcopal Church and called Calvary Mission and was run under the auspices of this Oxford group. It was just a typical so called Bowery Mission. We had 12 men who were running it, and uh, <coughs> excuse me. we only had available beds for about 35 men, and they were full every night. 
Well, when I was living there, and about two nights after I'd been over to see Bill, he appeared at the mission. Just as the meeting was about to start, well, this, he had a guy in tow, and they were both visibly drunk. But not too bad. I'm long about a great many of the, that was the, those meetings there were what's called testimonial meetings. We had a man up on the platform, and uh, he would uh, call on various men in the audience and get up, say what they'd found. Of course, the, most of them were doing it just to get a place to sleep. They called taking a nose dive for God to get a flop. That's the way they expressed it. Well, in the midst of all these proceedings, Bill gets up and walks up to the platform, and he's about six feet three, you know, and he leaves his elbow on the piano, and he starts to spout. <laughs> and the superintendent says, get him down. That's your friend. Pull him down out of there. It's a long go. Let's hear what he's got to say. The guy gave you a dirty look, but he let Bill talk. And then two or three days later, this was sometime late in November. As I've been talking to uh, Jim and Dick and some of the other boys, I wish that either Bill or I or somebody had kept a diary back there so that we could you know, remember dates and have some kind of memory uh, to, to our stories. Because she's about 24 years, and you turn out to the left, you recall things accurately. Well, this was sometime late in November and 1934. And it's a few days later that Bill got himself a taxi cab and two or three bottles of beer and went up to Towns Hospital in Central Park West. And when I heard he was up there, I guess it was the next day, I went up to see him. Because I made up my mind that having started this with Bill, it was up to me to stick it out. Which I think is a true thing in every AA 12-step in case you go on, if you're going to do it, don't spread yourself too thin and take on 25 or 30 people. I'd rather see you concentrate on one or two. Well, I don't know whether I'm my brother's keeper or not. But I do think that if you start and put something in a man's mind and possibly in his heart and soul, you got to stick with him to his tough spots as well as his, his victories. So you, you're the one that started it, and it's up to you to see if he gets on the street. So I followed Bill up up there, and we had some talks, and he got out and went back down around Wall Street and had to make a few little moves in there, and I kept riding herd on him, as they say out in Texas, and I rode herd on him, and uh, he came around when he began to attend Oxford group meetings, which I might add are exactly the same as AA meeting today. They had a speaker, I mean a leader. That's what they call it. They didn't call it chairman. They called it the leader on three or four speakers. And Bill spoke many times from Calvary House from Gramercy Park North in New York City. And later on, when we slipped from the Oxford group and became Alcoholics Anonymous, we went back to that place and had our meetings there up to about two years ago. The original Manhattan group. Now, of course, uh, Ohio, Cleveland, and one of the other cities uh, claim that they are the original AA, but, well, I don't know. I kind of dispute that a little bit. Because there was a clear succession right through from the Oxford group meetings until the time we broke off, and the meetings went to Adam Bill's house, and then they went to... Steinway Hall on 57th Street, and from there to Burke Taylor's shop on 5th Avenue. We occupied one of the floors of his tailor shop. And, uh, let's see, the, uh, then there's a, a direct succession, but I don't care whether Cleveland or anybody else claims their first group, it makes little difference, the thing got started. So, Bill and I were together a great deal that first winter, and then I went back to Albany in uh, 1936. And Bill went on to found AA. Well, he, and he's really the one. I just had something to do with giving him the idea. He went on to, with Dr. Bob, 
filed AA. And uh, in 1937, I had a slip. I fell off the wagon after two years and seven months, which was slightly different from that DuPont film. The DuPont film had me fallen off a month after I talked to Bill, but that wasn't so. I was two months, two years and six months later. And I've had to go through the trouble off and on. Now, if I want to go back and count the years, I can count possibly 15 years of complete sobriety out of the 24, maybe 16 years. But they're the longest of 16 months and 8 months and 7 months and so on. And uh, the summer of 1953, I was again in New York City drinking. And I walked into the intergroup one day and uh, Hazel Wright, one of the secretaries there, said, I think I've got a man that can help you. He's got something real and something tangible. And she said, I'm going to call him right away. And she called this man. He came down to see me. He says, where do you drink? And I said, well, I ran a third of them. This is Let's go. And he said, I ran into Eva Graves, a man who originally came to see you over in Paris, France. He said, how's old Eddie doing? This guy said, I don't know Eddie, but I hear he's not doing at all. So he says, Steve told me that you didn't have a chance here in New York, and we don't think you have. I said, I know damn well I haven't. And look, I can't throw it off. Well, he said, how about going to Texas? Well, I said, I don't know about that. Well, he expounded on the virtues of Texas and the good old American ways of living that were still down in these parts of the country. He gave me $5 and bought me another drink and said, I'll see you tomorrow night. So he did and repeated the performance. And of course, I worked him for another $5. That's for sure. And a few more drinks. And that was Thursday night. Now, he said, I'm not going to see you anymore, but the office still holds good. Saturday morning, I walked over to his apartment building. And uh, he was outside. He was coming in one door and I was going in the other. And I said, Charlie, here I am. His name is Charlie Milton. And... Uh, I said, here I am. Well, he said, you ready to go to Texas? I don't know about Texas, I said, but I'm ready to quit drinking. I'm ready to drink since last night. So he took me up in his apartment and uh, got me some clean clothes and a shower, which I badly needed. That night he called up Odie Lancaster in Dallas and said, uh, how about taking this guy down there? All right, he said, send the Yankee son of a bitch down there. <laughs> I could hear Odie booming it out. <laughs> so the next, he got a reservation that night, uh, American Airlines, for Sunday evening, and it was the Sunday before Labor Day, September 6th. And the dirty so-and-so never even gave me a drink. After three months drunk, I got on board that plane, and I didn't know whether I was on a plane or a ferry boat or where I was. And I got off the plane as a non-stop, and I would have been off sure in hell if I was going to stop anywhere. I got off that plane, and I was the first person out of it. And no sooner I had that thing rolled up, and I zoomed, and I was down on the steps. I had enough flying for one night. And I got down there, and I looked around, and I saw two big guys. And of course, I was having hallucinations all over the place. And I said, they're either a couple of G-men or a couple of goons from some gangster squad. And then I heard that booming voice again, there's the Yankee bastard. There he is. I've seen him in New York. So... They got a hold of me and I put me in the car and took me down to Texas Clinic. And I stayed there. I guess I stayed there all together about two or three months. But the first two or three weeks, I, it was pretty rugged because I'm going to tell you right now, I had hallucinations all over the place. I didn't believe I was in Texas. I didn't dare go out of the place. Uh, one of the girls there that was taking care of the books and sort of running things took me downtown one day and I couldn't get back in that place fast enough. I was scared of the car, the traffic, I was scared of everything. And it wasn't when I was there two weeks later, the guy said, I'm going out to mail some letters to the airport. Do you want to go out? And I said, I sure do. I want to see this airport and see if I'm really in Dallas. And I got out there and I got out of the car and I walked up to this placard and said, Love Field, Dallas, Texas. I put my hand on it and I said, All right, I'm in Dallas. I believe it. I swear as I stand here, I did not believe I was in Dallas. Because it's been a pretty rugged drunk and a pretty hot summer, and I hadn't been much to eat in those three months. 
I was drinking everything I could lay my hands on, then to be cut short like that. Furthermore, they gave me some few goofballs down there, and I hate those things anyway. I hate the effect of them. They just make me... Well, I've, I'm sorry that I've taken up so much time telling you it's all been on myself, but I didn't know how to bring the history of AAN. You've all seen how it spread, how it's worked. I know that if it hadn't been for AA when I got to Texas, I never would have been able to survive. And just coming out here alone, I'd have been lost. It was tough enough as it was because I was among strange people, slightly different ways than ours. Uh, it, it was an upheaval to get from the Bowery down here in six hours and change yourself all around. But if it hadn't been for those good Texas people and the people in the suburban club, if I hadn't been uh, able to go around there and stay there and shake after it was two weeks before I went in the club, a little over two weeks, I walked by it one day and started up the steps, lost my nerve, and went back to the clinic. Almost like a guy going back and hiding under the bed. And I know the trouble times, they said, well, I know, I heard him talking, I don't know what we're going to do with this guy, he's going goofy. And then I heard a colored girl that worked there. She's quite an old uh, woman. And she said, don't you worry about that man. You just leave him alone and he's coming out of it. He's sick. And that's just what I was. I was sick. Mentally and physically. And then gradually I worked out of it. Nature took over. And then I was able to get around the club and get into the activities. And maybe I got into them too fast. That was the hottest summer that had been on record in the Texas Weather Bureau. I went down on a ranch, and I was well, out working the sheep with this man, and he put me in as a shoot man, and that's kind of rugged work in 95-degree day. And I got mixed up in an oil deal, and I sold some insurance stock, and every one of them flopped. The insurance company did, almost. They're still struggling to get back on its feet. And I got in another deal, and that flopped. I was sober a year, and one month after the year was up, I flopped. And that was in October 1954. I had 13 months, and I only had a few days drinking then. And uh, it was over a three-week period, but I got slapped in the county jail for 10 days, and that was Mr. Bill Decker's emporium. And I came out, and some friends took me in their house, and I sobered up. And I haven't had a drink since. In other words, I've had about five years of sobriety in Texas. Out of five years and one month, I've had five years of sobriety. Total. And I know that I'm grateful to Fever Graves over there in Paris and Charlie for following it up. And for the people in Texas and over here, all of you people, who have given me another chance. I couldn't have done it by myself. It isn't under my own steam, I did it. And I know that my sobriety in these four years, these last four years that I've been sober, it hasn't been my sole effort that's kept me sober. Nor do I believe it has been entirely the friendship and the help of people. I think it has been the help of a higher power. And while I've lost that idea some times along the best way of life, Thank God I got it back again. Because I know that I couldn't exist without it. There are times when I know I'm not like a great many people I hear so often. They say there isn't a day in their lives that they don't fight the desire to take a drink. Well, I'm telling you right now, flat out, I'd go get drunk. I couldn't be that much of a hero to fight it every day and every hour. I don't have that. But I do have periods every three or four months when it's maybe two or three days that's rugged. That's all I think about. He's taking a drink, and if I haven't got myself conditioned to the correct way of thinking and knowing that if I take that drink where I'm going to end up, and I have no doubt that this time, I don't know that that last drink that the drunk, that the, the liquor knocked me so badly physically and mentally, too, that I'd never survive another one. And I get that in my head, and I get I keep it there, in spite of the fact that I want to go out and... I get sick of this being in harness every day and going to work. 
And uh, I'm getting along in years, right? I like to have a little rest once in a while, but I got to go and work. And I often think if I come home tonight, if I could take one good plug of whiskey or one bottle of Valentine's Ale and go eat, it would help me a lot, and it probably would help me physically. It would give me a lift. But I know I can't do it. So what is the use of time or the idea? I don't quite, quite get so much the idea that I used to. And I'd like to get drunk. Although that occurs once in a while because I think in every one of us is another person is an alter ego. And that old drunk, the Bilzebi Thatcher, is still in there. He may be dormant, but he's there. He's just like a volcano. He takes the top off and he's going zoom. Only this time he goes zoom, boom, and it'll be all over. And I haven't got anything much more to say except stick to your AA and stick to God. And I think that you'll find that if you're having any trouble, you'll find help there. I want to thank Dick and I want to thank the other members and all you people who have entertained me and I sure have enjoyed coming to Memphis. Thank you. Keith and A.A. and Harold and the boys are passing the remittance basket. I want to say again, if you happen to go out Texas way where Ebby has been and where Ebby has done the last five years, the A.A. out there is no different than the A.A. that you have here in Memphis, Tennessee. Because my first visit to Memphis was in 1935 when you first organized and you were getting together then. And one of the great pleasures of AA is to walk in and see men and women right in this audience here tonight who are here and active in 35 that are here and active tonight. Everyone that comes in AA just doesn't walk in, bless themselves, and stay sober. You have a disease called alcoholism, and it's a tough one. Some people are lucky, I don't know. I don't know who I shot, whose mother-in-law or mine that I pushed downstairs that gave me the right. I, I can never grasp, even as today. Why should I stay sober and some other guy didn't? He's an alcoholic just like I am. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to try to answer. But I do know this as long as you remember yesterday. It's a great help for them all. The quicker you forgive yourself, the quicker you're going to get well. But when you forget where you found your sobriety, how you got sober, and you retire to the country club, and no longer are active in AA, you are no longer taking your medicine. And if you don't take your medicine someday down the road, oh, you can point to me, as Ebby can. I can show you guys that are sober five, six, and seven, eight, and ten years that never show up anymore. But for your information, they're not dead yet. I know a lot of people with a different diseases that have arrested them. You can arrest your alcoholism, and maybe you can stay sober if you never come back to AA. And if you never come back to AA, I'm one that will never miss you. Because if you're ungrateful as that for what you found, I don't think, me personally, that I would need you. And I'm only speaking for myself. Because you found it. I found it. And I think today, the greatest trust that we can have in Alcoholics Anonymous, not for you who are so lucky that are here tonight and all over the world in AA, if God in his infinite wisdom gave us the privilege of staying sober such as we are tonight, and I turn my back on the guy I left behind me, I don't deserve to buy. That's merely my own opinion. I belong to the greatest fellowship in the world, and that fellowship is called Alcoholics Anonymous. Everything I have tonight, everything I will ever get any other night from here in, comes from men and women 
God bless you just like you. May I always be with you, and may someday I really be worthy of you. And all meetings all over the country, those who wish to join us, we close by saying, We are Father. Those who care to, will you join us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.